1984 won't be like 1984. Get your iPod. iPod's here. You like your Macintosh. You like your Macintosh. Your Macintosh. Up, up. And the Macintosh of all the machines I've ever seen is the only one that needs that standard. iPod. A thousand songs in your pocket. If today were the last day of my life, would I want to do what I am about to do today? Yeah, I'm Robert Scoble, and I work at PodTech uh, doing video blogging at scobleshow.com. So most of my, of my listeners don't know you, to tell you the truth, because <laughs> because some of them are really Apple freaks. Um, but I, I, I watch a lot of Apple stuff, too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to get into Apple, but uh, you know their, their PR department doesn't let anybody interview them. So. Yeah, but the, um, because I have a past as a .NET developer, I, I, I have to say the past because they keep on coming at me for uh, me to doing some .NET missions and giving a lot of million dollars. Yeah. But I'm still not, not willing to stop this podcasting thing because it's a lot of thing. It's a lot of, of fun, yeah. even though it's paying like 10 times less. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, t- tell them, actually, tell them, the listeners, what, what you've done uh, at Microsoft and, and before since. To tell you the truth, I don't, I don't know... I don't know what the hell you've done before Microsoft. Yeah, well, I, I was uh, in the 90s. I was planning uh, conferences for programmers, mostly .NET programmers. Okay. And uh, two of my speakers, I was doing a web conference for CNET, and two of my speakers said, "Hey, why don't you, you know, why don't we do a blogging session?" I, I, and I did some research, and I could only find like a hundred tech blogs, okay. or a hundred blogs, period. You know, and I was like, "No, nah, there's not enough people doing this yet to do a session at a conference," yeah. which is funny. Now there's entire conferences yeah. about blogging. Um, but they talked me into starting one, and within a few weeks, I'd been invited to Steve Wozniak's Super Bowl party, okay. you know, a co-founder of Apple Computer, and um, uh, I was in Wired Magazine, and all sorts of fun things to happen real fast, yeah. and Dave Weiner linked to me and sent me 3,000 people, and okay. I was like, whoa, there's a lot more people reading these yeah. things than they're actually doing them, which remains true today, you know, yeah. even though there's, you know, 55 million blogs, or yeah. even 10 million updated blogs, yeah. there's a far bigger audience that's actually reading them thanks to Google because a lot of people read blogs they don't know that they're even reading a blog because they search for an Apple answer and they find some blog like yours or a podcast and they watch it and they don't even know they're even watching or reading a blog but then I got a job at um, NEC which is makes tablet PCs and pocket PCs and an executive at, at Microsoft bought a tablet PC from me and Within four months, he asked me, "Oh, why don't you come and do this blogging thing?" Because okay. he, he started reading my blog, yeah. and so I worked at Microsoft for three years doing a, doing um, evangelism, which was really helping software developers build software for the mm-hmm. next version of Windows. Um, and while there, one of the tools I, you know, we came up with was doing the Channel Nine website. Yeah. And so I took a camera just like yours, a little. 200, at first, it was two hundred fifty dollar camera, yeah. and I'd walk into people's offices and say, "Who are you?" But sometimes pretty fucked up ton- sound qualities. Oh yeah, you know, because you don't use micro. You know, I didn't even use a yeah. professional microphone. I just used a little microphone on the camera, yeah. and I would just walk in and say, "Who are you? And what do you do? Yeah, and yeah. show me what you're doing." You know, and, yeah. and that took off. And uh, by the time I left, you know, two and a half years later, that site had four point three million unique visitors a month. You know, all yeah. based on word of mouth, all yeah. just people linking to it. Or, yeah. or and now they have real cubes. I, I read a few days ago in the blog of Ruby Blythe that they ordered c- microphone cubes like my one for Channel 9. Imagine, yeah. imagine the, the evolution. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're getting, well, when I left, they, they had bought me a nice camera finally. Yeah. You know, so, um, but, you know, and then I left and joined this little startup, and we're here in Podtech's offices. Okay. Brand new offices. We just moved in. Yeah. And, um, in three months, I've interviewed oh, 90 or 100 people and more than 55 CEOs yeah. and been on a, a president, presidential candidate's mm-hmm. plane. And, yeah. and well, we'll speak about that later because I'm, 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 in, I'm also a bit into politics, so uh, yeah. it's really interesting. Um, yeah, you, you talk about the Channel 9. That, that's, uh, I guess it's one of the first time I heard about you might be Channel 9. I found it very cool, especially being a .NET developer at that time. Um, and uh, I would like to, to have something like that at Apple. Why do you think Apple is not that open-minded, as, in my opinion, as, as, as Microsoft is? Because what you've done at Microsoft with Channel 9 is, is pretty amazing. 
Yeah. I mean, showing off Vista is coming next year. Well, maybe in two years, maybe in three years, yeah. whatever. <laughs> well, it, it, what I did was that was interesting was I, I uh, had conversations that were unedited without a PR person. Usually when you go into big companies, like I was at Intel yesterday, and there was a PR person with us all the time to make sure that, you know, not only make sure that somebody doesn't say something stupid, you know, and, and reveal yeah. a secret or something like that, but also just so that they would be aware of what the person said. And I didn't have to deal with that. I, and so I got a lot more conversation out of people. Because people sort of um, start self-censoring when they see a PR for, oh, yeah. I, am I really allowed to say yeah. that? And they start getting into this self-doubt and they start closing down. And, and in fact, um, most people will even sort of give you body language, like yeah, they're yeah. sort of closed to the conversation. They don't, they're uh, not willing to engage. Um, and so I, that was one thing. Why can't Apple do it? Apple has a few things. One, um, they have they have a culture there that Steve Jobs talks for the company and nobody else does, yeah. and that's going to be a very hard culture for them to change until Steve Jobs is out. Um, and second, they're very compartmentalized. Uh, for instance, my brother-in-law is a senior developer at Apple on hardware, and he is working on something that's coming out next week. Okay. He has working on two of the chips on the motherboard. Okay. He has not seen the motherboard, and he has not seen the design of the thing yeah. that he's putting the chips in. It's pretty amazing so, how they do it. Uh, well, they do that so that uh, it's hard for leaks to happen, yeah. and it's hard for anybody to get really good information about what's coming. Um, and it also protects the employee because the only thing that they can talk about, you know, is what they worked on, yeah. and, and they have no concept of the bigger thing that, mm -hmm. that are, it's put in, it, it, it helps protect them. Because let's be honest, people naturally talk, even if they're yeah. pretty secretive. You know, people like to talk about what, yeah. they're, what they're working on. And uh, so because of that, it's going to be Depends really on the hard. amount of alcohol they drank before. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be really hard because of that compartmentalization for a guy to come in who isn't PR and get that kind of conversation mm -hmm. going. Uh, for instance, my brother-in-law's card key only works on his corner of the building. Yeah. He can't walk into other buildings, right? So I had free access to everything at Microsoft. Mm -hmm. Even the yeah. offices in Denmark I could get into, right? Okay. You know, worldwide, I could walk into any yeah. office. I could walk into Bill Gates' office, yeah, yeah. you know? Well, like you've done. And ask him, who are you? Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> Who the frick are you? <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, be careful, you're leaving the camera. <laughs> oh. hey. It's just because I'm not that important, except for my mother. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and so I, I had the ability to walk around the halls and make friends, and, and I did a lot of work off the camera to, make, to build relationships with people in the company and understand what they were doing and understand what they could talk about and couldn't talk about, mm -hmm. you know, even beforehand. And... Um, that's hard to do at Apple. It it could be done by the PR team, but the PR teams are trained not to do, not to do that, mm -hmm. right? They, they don't like the YouTube world. Okay. It's it's too much information, yeah. too loosey goosey, mm -hmm. and they like to have um, committee decided messages that go out. And that was what was different about what okay. I was doing was. I was not a committee. I was one guy with a camera, and I would decide what to put up, yeah, okay. and without checking with any PR team, yeah, yeah. and without checking with a committee. Yeah. And at Apple, that just doesn't happen. Don't you think it might change at Apple, or they will need to change in this whole uh, world where the Times Magazine says we are the person of the year? I, you know I think, what I mean? I think they will have to change at some point. Um, Right now, it's working for them. They they get a lot of press because of the shock and awe. Because you you even though we've seen lots of rumors about what's coming next week, that you know some sort of iPhone, know. we don't really know what's coming, and we don't know how thin it'll be. We don't know what the battery life will be. We don't know the partners that'll be announced. We we haven't seen a really good yeah. picture of the thing yet. And so Steve Jobs has everybody's attention on him to, next week. And he's going to pull something out of his pocket, and everybody's going to go, oh, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> and it, that works while they have Steve Jobs. Yeah. Now, mean, what, it, what happens in 10 years when they don't have Steve Jobs? Um, I think they, they need to have relationships with people deeper in the company. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's me, and a lot of people disagree with me. I mean, I, you can see it on my blog. I keep pushing Apple, you know, hey, yeah. why don't you come out here and ha have a blog and, ha yeah, and yeah. listen to the customers? And have a conversation, even though you can't talk about future product. At least you know I can 
complain about what you know because my my son's macbook broke you know it's a week old and it still it started shutting down randomly yeah. you know instead of having to go to my own blog and rant about it why don't you give me a place to come and talk to you yeah. about it and see if i can get some yeah. fit help with that um but yeah they they don't believe in it yeah. you just had a post about dell uh, recognizing an error for example yeah well dell was a good company an example of this they were close to bloggers as well And they thought, oh, we don't need to listen to bloggers. But then a, a blog called uh, Jeff Jarvis's Buzz Machine kept writing about his bad experiences with Dell, and he got into the New York Times with that. That's the problem with bloggers. It's not that the blogs have a huge audience, because I, I have 10,000 people reading me a day, yeah. which is, you know, for a blogger, uh, oh, I want that audience. That's yeah, a yeah. huge audience. But for the mainstream press, that's not a huge it's audience. Not, I mean, CNN talks to 2 million, 3 million, 5 yeah. million people. Um, you know, so 10,000 10, people to a PR team is like way down on the list. I, oh, we don't need to talk to those guys. But what they miss is a lot of the press reads blogs. Mm -hmm. And they, the blogs are the uh, warfare, is where the yeah. ground warfare is. And if a lot of people are complaining about something, mm -hmm. all of a sudden the press will write about it. Yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden that story will move from the blogs and into the mainstream press. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people miss that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, as a developer, I, I enjoyed a lot of the PowerPoint cast, screencast, whatever you call that, that they had uh, at MSDN because MSDN offers that. I've been talking to Scott Stevenson yesterday, which is the Cocoa Guru. Yeah. Um, why don't you think Apple does not offer that much of a coolness or of um, so much information? Because obviously, I'm not the only one to say that there is much more things on MSDN than on ADC, for example. Yeah, um, I think it's the culture again. Uh, Microsoft looks at itself as a platform company, not a products company, mm -hmm. at, at least on the Windows team. Because Windows, the Windows team, doesn't make the, the hardware that you buy, mm -hmm. right? Doesn't make, make the experience when yeah. you go into Best Buy and buy a laptop or you call Dell and buy a machine. They don't do that. They don't make the hardware. They don't make the, the store that you go into. They don't do the customer support. Uh, all they do is make the software, and, and they make the pla they see see themselves as a yeah. platform. For a platform to be successful, and the reason that Microsoft ended up with 95% of the market share, is they made it very easy for developers to build on top of Windows, mm -hmm. and they really courted the developers to make sure that the developers built the coolest stuff for Windows first, and then for the Mac second. Yeah. And by doing that, that causes a lot of economic pressure to buy Windows machines instead of Macintosh machines. Um, now, will a Apple change that? I don't know. I Apple's getting a lot of traction with developers. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I go around Silicon Valley with Web2 stuff. There's a company called Sosta that is all the about all their developers brand new Mac Mac Pros okay. because they can run Windows, Windows. Mac and Linux all yeah. on the same box where before they had to buy three separate boxes to do that. Um, And that that makes their developers more productive. Mm -hmm. But funny enough, those those developers test on Windows first they, yeah. because they know most of their the customers. Well, most of their customers are going to run their software on Windows, mm -hmm. not on Mac. So they're going to make sure that it runs on IE5 and IE6 yeah. and IE7 first. Mm -hmm. Then they're going to make sure it runs on Safari. And you can still see that kind of tension among developers. Yeah. But Microsoft looks at itself as a platform company. Yeah. It might also be that Microsoft thinks more like developers, 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 where Apple thinks users, users, users. Yeah, and, and you can see that culture. Apple has the stores and really builds awesome experiences mm -hmm. for users and really thinks about you know how to make it possible to do video and stuff like that, where um, Microsoft really knows it, where it won in the marketplace is with developers building stuff on top of Windows. I think this is why Microsoft is so freaked out about Linux. Because Linux is very attractive to, to developers because they can see inside the OS and if something's not working right. But very or, unattractive to users. Absolutely. And, oh. and yeah, but will it be, their fear is someday that Linux will keep evolving mm -hmm. and at some point somebody will figure out how to make it attractive to yeah. end users. Mm -hmm. you know, and developers are pretty smart. They figure out, you know, they iterate. If they're iterating faster on a, on a Linux platform instead of iterating on a Windows platform, They'll yeah. see that eventually the the trend line beats uh, yeah. Windows, you know. Yeah. And, and Microsoft's a uh, company that's playing for a hundred years, not just for yeah. you know 
the next quarter or some yeah. results. Yeah. You know? yeah. Microsoft's going to be around a long time. It's yeah. not going to be a company that goes away, even if it makes mistake after mistake after mistake. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, and by the way, I, I have the feeling it's it's much more easier to write software on Windows than on the Mac. But on the other hand, I also have the feeling, not to get me wrong to all the Windows developers out there, but I, I have really the feeling that there is much more better application on the Mac than on Windows because it's so hard to, uh, to write applications on the Mac. And, and also there's the culture that you have to make him uh, an application that looks Mac-like. Even, yeah. I mean, I remember uh, the Mac back in 1984, they had lots of guidelines, and Guy Kawasaki would get on your ass if you built an app, <laughs> app that looked crappy, yeah. you know, because <laughs> that wasn't the Mac way. Yeah. And so there, anybody who builds Mac apps is into that culture and is into the cult almost of building an app that looks and performs very well. Mm -hmm. um, where on Windows, it's you know there's a lot of businesses that build a software for for a work. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, you know, a work group, a yeah. small number of people. They don't need to put the polish onto those kinds of apps yeah. because they're used by 50 people. Yeah. What you know? So you the only thing you need to make sure is that it works and that it works for those 50 people and those 50 people can use it. And it's the, those little apps that de that gets Windows everywhere. I mean, I, you, when you walk around a business, you know, all yeah. you see is Windows mm -hmm. everywhere. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, it's rare when you see a Mac or a Linux machine. Okay. You know, when you walk into a, a store. Even in the valley? Even in the valley. Okay. You know, even at Google, you know, which is an anti-Microsoft company, mm -hmm. you walk around there. And, and even Mark Lukowski said, I, I, I use Windows to build my apps on. Mm -hmm. You know, I could use Linux, and I use Linux too. But yeah, yeah. But, you know, Windows is where it is, yeah. and my, most of my customers are on Windows, yeah. so I need to make sure that I, everything I do works on a, a Windows yeah. box. Yeah. You know? And funny enough, um, I was watching over the window of a, one of the few companies in Cupertino that are not Apple, because in Cupertino it's Apple is everywhere, and it was running Windows, and, and, and it was just, just a side of, of the, the Apple uh, offices, so it's pretty funny, actually. Yeah. So uh, let, let's start now. Um, you've been living here in the in the valley uh, for the last 30 years or whatever. Yeah, I, uh, my dad moved here in 1971, and I was five years Tell old. Tell the truth, your dad is Steve Jobs or what? No. <laughs> my dad worked at Wozniak. <laughs> no, my dad worked at Lockheed. Actually, my dad worked at Lockheed just like uh, Waz's dad did, actually, yeah. Yeah. and was brought brought here uh, for Apex, actually. So worked okay. at the company that invented the VCR, and he was a PhD candidate from okay. New Jersey. And so, I, yeah, I got to watch the valley turn from orchards, you know, the final shifting of orchards to, yeah. you know, the high-tech mm -hmm. world that you mm -hmm. see. I mean, I, when I grew up, Apple was one building uh, about the size of the building we're in, very okay. small building. Okay. And I got a tour when I was in junior high of Apple when they were one cool. building. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and now it's like 50 buildings. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, it's yeah. all over. The whole Cupertino is yeah, either yeah. either Apple or, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah, I've seen yesterday that this building uh, where the original Mac team was. Uh, I don't remember the name. Yeah. But there is one building over there um, now. Um, and and but I guess at the time where you was at Microsoft, you had to be somewhere else for a few um, years. Yeah, we went, we moved up to Seattle, okay. um, up to Bothell near Redmond, which is okay. uh, 30 minutes outside of Seattle, okay. which is where Microsoft's headquarters yeah. are. So talking about about Microsoft and your family, uh, you talk about that already. But your son is pretty uh, um, crazy about. Uh, about all the Mac things. Um, and Apple stuff. I mean, he has yeah. three iPods, I think. How do you live that? <laughs> you still keep on trying um, him to try other things like the Zune or whatever, but he's not willing. No, in fact, I have an interview with him uh, that we did at Christmas where he reviews the Zune. He's he, he's pretty funny. He's a funny reviewer, and, and he's very astute. He picked it up and played with it for 10 minutes and totally nailed the review, you know, and explained exactly what they could improve to make it interesting. Would you say it's brainwashed by Apple? A little bit, but... Just uh, like we are all... Yeah, but I I think he's open to other things. But uh, he, he he likes having really nice experiences. He is a consumer, 13-year-old consumer, yeah. and he's into that. he's in that age that is... Deciding what's cool, yeah, you know, yeah. and uh, you know, he says his school is an iPod school. You know, yeah. everybody at school uses yeah. iPods, and if you don't have an iPod, you're yeah. not cool, you know. So I guess I just want a listener. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he li he listens to a of lot your... of Apple's Apple's uh, web yeah, logs. Yeah. So. But because, well, let's be honest, I I was really happy about the Zune when I heard about the the, the first. 
time, like yeah. a lot of Apple guys, because we thought, wow, a good concurrent. But at the end of the day, yeah. it's not really. It, it's a, a version one product. Yeah. And it has some exciting things that could turn exciting. For instance, putting a Wi-Fi antenna in it. Could just use it for sure. Yeah, that's lame, right? Yeah. But if you could download, you know, Don and Drew right to your your device without having to dock it somewhere, mm. that would make sense because I have Wi-Fi in my house. Why do I need to hook a wire up to my computer yeah. to download stuff? That's just lame. And so, but I have a feeling they're gonna turn on some weird stuff, yeah, you yeah. know, because it it, it makes sense. It, I think that team is very young and started. They started just about a year ago, so they had ten months to get a product out. And yeah. the way the way Microsoft works, the, the program managers there work. They'll put a list of features that they want to do on the wall, okay. and then they'll say, "Oh, we only have time to do ten of these hundred features," okay. and that's why it's always a version three company because uh, the version one is just let's get on the wall let's get on the right wall right version two is about getting on the right target right and version three is about getting the bullseye okay. making sure you're the perfect device where Steve Jobs tries to do that version three out of the gate and sometimes he swings and misses right yeah. the uh, we've seen sometimes like the Mac cube remember that in the 90s yeah that was 10 months yeah or or Plus 10 months or with the next computer he tried to put just an optical drive in it without having a floppy drive brilliant decision and the right decision long term but the wrong decision short term yeah. because nobody had optical drives back then and people were like I have tons of floppies and that's how I move my data around and he was trying to push yeah. the entire industry yeah. to do something innovative and different and th that's what tags him with that right mm. but uh, and that's also why you know other companies like Microsoft who aren't so visionary and so yeah. trying to push the market yeah. come in and just steal a lot of market share because they don't make short-term mistakes, they make longer-term mistakes. Yeah, yeah. You know? I guess it's kind of the same problem I have with my Mac Pro, which has this really expensive RAM, FB, DIMM, whatever they're called, two times more expensive. And yeah, I don't know if it's really the point of paying two times more because is it so fast? But they're only using the Mac Pros. Yeah. So that's the reason why they're expensive. Uh, well, they know that you know coming soon are going to be four processors and eight mm. processors and that you need if you want to use a, a processor like that, because I just visited Intel's new uh, chip fab that, that they'll be shipping some really neat processors out, you need to be able to sh ship a lot of data into that chip and a lot of data out. Yeah. And so that's, again, an example. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see, not quite ready for today, but three years from now, five yeah. years from now, when everybody has an eight-core machine or, you know, has a machine that needs that kind of data throughput to get performance, yeah. it's going to look like a brilliant decision. Right? Yeah, yeah. But today, most of us, we, we use our machines for email and yeah. blogging and you know, stuff that doesn't require a huge or, amount of data. You know, we're not doing uh, weather simulations and we're not doing yeah. HD video yet. Five years from now, everybody's going to be doing HD video because a camera like yours that costs three hundred dollars mm -hmm. is going to is going to be HD. You know, yeah. five years from now, and you're going to need a huge machine to do HD. I, I have a Mac Pro, and it's slow even with HD. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you yourself, you use also a Mac to edit video with Final Cut, right? Yeah, we have a Mac Pro right next door uh, okay. with a thirty-inch monitor, okay. and uh, I just got a seventeen-inch Mac Pro for or a Mac MacBook Pro for uh, okay. home. And uh, yeah, most of the video editors and the video bloggers in the world use Macs and okay. use Final Cut. So, so why not using Adobe's solutions on, on Windows, for example, Adobe's? Because most of the other uh, video bloggers are using Macs and okay. using Final Cut, and I wanted to be able to interchange video with them, okay. and I wanted to use the same tools that they're using. So um, it came down to just going with the flow and going yeah. with what you know most of my friends were doing. Um, I, yeah, I, I did all my video in Microsoft on a Windows box with just um, Movie Maker, which was a free tool. You don't need expensive tools to do video anymore. Yeah. Well, I do everything under iMovie until now. Yeah, exactly. So I, I actually spent you know a few hundred dollars to buy uh, Final Cut Express HD because okay. I wanted to do HD and play with that. But um, are your podcast iPod ready in the meantime? Uh, they're getting there. I, uh, most That's a tricky them, problem over there. Most of them are now, but uh, I, I'm getting some complaints that they're not working today. So, okay. But I, I, have, I will make sure that they work. I have the same problem because I'm, I'm doing them iPod ready, but on the the, the bad point is I have 320 by 180 yeah. pixel, and it's so bad 
on the on the computer screen, but you can go to the 640 by 480 because it's only on the last generation iPod. What Apple is not saying, so it's and not even like then you have to make sure you use the MPEG format, not not the .mov format, which is like. Wait a second, Apple invented QuickTime. <laughs> they yeah, invented yeah, yeah. the .mov format, and they won't even play .mov on the iPhone. Yeah, .mov format is, is like bastard file format used for everything. You can drop a .mov file in GarageBand, yeah. for example. You have to export it to an AIFF. Yeah, uh, uh, formats are just crazy. Uh, it's a crazy world, and uh, I'm using wide 16 by 9 format. Mm. So am I. Which iPod doesn't, you know, iPod is four by three. Yeah, format. I have that, but I have stripes. Yep, I do too. And uh, and then you have to make sure it plays. It, 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 and you said, like you said, it, I can make it play on the latest generation pretty easily, but earlier generations is harder. What I'm actually doing is converting most of my interviews to audio only, okay, because yeah. most it's of my interviews right. are like what you're doing here with me. Yeah. And most of the content there, I mean, people can get a little bit from seeing us, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. but. Most of the content is audio anyways, yeah, and why yeah. not just listen to that on your yeah. iPod? Yeah. And, and I think that's how you know, most people will, will yeah. watch it. I mean, if you're actually going to watch uh, somebody coding on the screen, you're going to want to see that on, yeah. a, on a screen and blow it up so yeah. you can actually see the, the code that mm -hmm. you know, Mark Lukoski at Google is going to write. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah that's, that's right. Um, you were recently asking on your blog to, mo to meet uh, Steve Jobs. Yeah, yeah. Or are you succeeding? No, I met him in the street corner one time, but uh, uh, no. So he just stopped him. And, don't move. I don't think I, I don't think that they consider blogging important yet. Um, they'll talk to Stephen Levy or Walt Mossberg. Stephen Levy is the main tech guy at Newsweek, and Walt Mossberg is the main tech guy at the Wall Street Journal. They'll talk to people like that and let them into their press conferences, but they don't yet see that bloggers or people on YouTube or you know, um, I guess people just, MySpace yeah. matter to them. They, they don't consider them important yet. Uh, I think that'll change over the next two years. But you know, it, yeah. Apple Apple likes to be this mysterious, secretive yeah. company, and and if they're talking to everybody in, 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 under the sun, they lose some of that mystery. I mean, I, a good example of that is I, I interviewed John Edwards, who's running for president. Yeah. And he said the same thing. He said, I, I want to have a different cam campaign. I want to have a grassroots campaign. Be where transparent. The, it'd be transparent where normal people can come and meet me and video me and talk with me and put that up and decide for themselves whether I'm good or not. And uh, based on their personal experience where, you know, a lot of campaigns are very... Oh, we'll talk to the mainstream press because we want to put that big image yeah. out there, but we uh, talk to a blogger. Yeah. What the hell's that? You know. <laughs> See, that's why I like Bill Gates, and I get a lot of a lot of people shouting on me when I say that. Yeah. But that's why I like I like Bill Gates. He meets everybody. Yeah, and, and he's really open mind. Yeah, I, I met him at a, a party after Comdex. I, in fact, I followed him at, followed him around in Comdex in 1995. He's a pretty interesting guy to, to talk with. I think I'm going to meet with him at CES next week, mm. too. So. Have you seen him at that time, uh, Pirate of Silicon Valley? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I knew a lot of those stories. I would interviewed Steve Wozniak in college. Yeah. And so I knew a lot of those stories from personal um, experience, you know, how, how things went down. So. What do you think the, the film was um, turning uh, stories? Um, it's it's probably 80 percent true. Okay. I, actually, I, I've heard story it, not, now that I worked at Microsoft and I actually met some of the people who were, went, were involved in, in DOS. In fact, I met the, the brother of the guy who invented DOS, Tim Patterson's brother. Doug is a... Uh, so the guy they bought, they bought DOS from after yeah. selling it to IBM? Yeah. Well, he invented it. That's at, where I said Bill Gates is a genius. Yeah. He invented it at Seattle Computer Works and um, sold it to Microsoft. Actually, it wasn't Bill Gates who wanted to buy DOS. Okay. That's one story that I found fascinating. Bill didn't, didn't want to be in the OS business. Okay. He didn't think it was going to make any money because I I mean, go back and you have to go back in time to that time when Microsoft was a tiny little company, almost the size of PodTech, right? Yeah. A really small company compared to this big monolith, yeah. IBM. And they, they thought IBM was going to make sure that they made all the money in this business, yeah. in the OS business, and that the only way that they could make money was to be a tools vendor on top of the OS. Okay. The first Microsoft product was BASIC, right? It was a yeah, BASIC yeah, compiler. Yeah. Yeah. And so Bill Gates didn't want to get into the OS business. From what I was told, he sent the IBM team twice down to DRI research in Monterey, which owns CPM, okay. which is the was the top OS of its time uh, on Altair and on other computers. Yeah. And 
twice the IBM team got rebuffed. They, they, they wouldn't sign their non-disclosures. They mm -hmm. wouldn't deal with them very friendly. And so the IBM team kept coming back to, to Bill and saying, I can't, we can't deal with these, these guys down in uh, Gary Kildall down in, in Monterey, California. Can you please get us uh, an OS? Yeah. We need an OS because we can't build one because we need to have it. Yeah. Again, remember, they were being disrupted by Apple Computer yeah. back then. This was the time of Apple II, yeah. right? And Apple II was out and was getting really popular. Everybody was buying Apple IIs back in the late late uh, 70s, right? 77, 78, mm -hmm. 79, 80. Mm -hmm. uh, the PC came out in 81. So they were under really hardcore pressure to get something out. So they went, kept going back to Bill. And yeah. Bill... Bill didn't want to do it, but somebody on his team, and I don't know who it was, because I, I heard the story from somebody else who was on the team, and, and I forgot the name. But somebody else on the team said, "I know I have a friend at Computer C in Seattle, and he has a he has a, a pretty good clone of okay. CPM, and we should buy that okay. and and make that work for this new project." Okay. And that was that was one brilliance. The okay. brilliance of Bill was the license. Getting, uh, he has uh, his dad is a lawyer, mm. and he Which uh, helped him when he was driving too fast over there. In well, well, it helped yeah. him in this license because he understood how to change the license so that he would be able to sell copies on his own, yeah. and that was the brilliance. Mm. That was what caused Microsoft. So, yeah, yeah. and and. Um, You know, that was what caused Microsoft to get big because he had the ability to go and sell his own copies yeah. of DOS. And you know, computer software, if you can make a piece of software, you it, there's no marginal cost to making mm -hmm. it, right? It costs you another dollar to make another floppy drive yeah. disk. And so you can sell that disk for $100 yeah. and there's huge margins and it got really big really yeah. fast. I keep on thinking about this movie because I saw it recently, which is weird because it's a pretty old movie in the meantime, it's yeah. 99. Um, what's your favorite character in this movie? Because I have my one. I, I like Waz. I, I'm still a, a Waz. Okay. I, I will go to my deathbed being a Waz defender, uh, partly because he got me $40,000 worth of Macs in college to get my journalism department going. Okay. Um, but partly because I, I just think he's the good guy in, yeah. in the whole thing. He's the engineer. He's the guy who didn't want a lot of credit. He gave away a lot of stock to his coworkers or his employees. Well, that's a pretty amazing story Yeah, at and, that time. And he continues donating money and doing interesting things. It, You know, he hasn't done much in terms of tech since, you know, since that original Apple II. When I interviewed him a, a couple months ago in Seattle when he was doing his book tour, I didn't realize I, when I had the Apple II, he, he built the entire Apple II. He was the only engineer on the Apple II. And that's just an amazing feat yeah. to me, you know, because you look at that motherboard. I, I used to uh, help my mom solder, build the motherboards and solder them. And uh, you look at that motherboard, and so even in '77, it was so complex and had so much going on on it that any one person could build that. It's just amazing. I mean, look at uh, the new iPods that are coming out next week. My brother-in-law doesn't even build two of the chips on that yeah. motherboard. He helps another company build two of those chips, yeah. and then he integrates it into the system, you know, and, and for one guy to understand a complex system like that and be able to build it and build it very well, just amazing. Yeah. Well, just as a viewer of the film, I really love Steve Ballmer in the film because oh, it's, really? it's so funny. <laughs> he's a great guy. But he's he, the guy looking at Playboy and all those things. But he, he's, a, he's a, you know, he, it's interesting. Both App, Apple and Microsoft needed two people. Apple needed Waz and Jobs. Yeah. If it was just an engineer, Apple wouldn't have happened because Steve Jobs was the guy who sold it to everybody and he negotiated the contracts to buy the equipment and buy the parts and, and get the deals. And, and it was those two people together that made Apple. If, if Waz wasn't there, Steve Jobs couldn't have sold anything. He, he wouldn't have had anything to sell because he didn't build it. It, yeah. it was Waz who built it, Jobs who sold it and bought the parts and made all the contracts that yeah. stuff. Same thing at Microsoft. Microsoft was Gates, who was the technologist, and Bomber, who was the sales guy. And a lot of people give Bomber shit, but he built this uh, sales organization that's unparalleled, uh, that continues to bring in billions of dollars every quarter, yeah. <laughs> you know, and all over the world. Yeah. And they're they're very uh, very effective sales team. And right. he he and his team built that. And a lot of technologist geeks, when you meet them, they don't 
like the marketing or the sales yeah. or the legal yeah. part of business, yeah. but you need that to build a great business. Yeah. And um, I think the two of them together, if you took Bomber out of the equation, yeah. you only have Gates. Yeah. yeah, you might have some interesting technology and you might have a company, but it's the sales organization that goes with the geeks that makes something really huge, mm -hmm. you know, because you need to do yeah. both, you yeah. know. So Revenues to keep geeks employed, yeah. Yeah. you know. So who's the second guy at Pod Tech? Um, well, I, I don't know. Um, there's a whole team. I mean, there's there's a controller here. There's a COO. There's, you know, John Furrier, who's the C, CEO. There's me, who's going out and chasing co content. There's a sales team. You know, so, okay, cool. so you know, we're splitting up the roles too. It's not just one guy here, okay. it, although it might look that way. There's 38 people here already. Cool. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. You know how fast startups, when they're when yeah. they're uh, yeah. trying to go after yeah. something, get big really fast. Yeah. So uh, last questions. Uh, let's forget a bit that we're geeks and let's think that we are our citizens. Let's talk a bit about politics. Yeah. So I guess you'd agree with me that politics is pretty important, right? Yeah. I, I, I ignored it for a long time. I used to really be into it when I was in college. Um, you know, I followed Walter Mond Mondale and Ronald Reagan around and took pictures and did reporting on them back in, in the mid-'80s. And, um, and I followed Clinton. And then around the mid-'90s, I just I, I got cynical out of it. I, okay. I got out of it. And having... I don't know. The last couple of weeks, I've gotten really back into it, mostly because Edwards invited me on his plane, and so I was doing a lot of research to try to figure out what the political landscape looks okay. like. I, yeah, I think it's important. I, it, you know, it's uh, important for industry certainly to pay attention to, because if you don't, somebody will take advantage of you politically, yeah. and you know, do things to you, take your jobs over to China, you know. Mm. Uh, keep you from forming a, a labor union because somebody blocked that in, in terms of policy or, uh, you know, or all sorts of stuff, gas prices. It's yeah. all political. There's yeah, a lot yeah. of politics there. Yeah. So it looks like you're a bit behind John Edwards, which uh, most Europeans will like or not. I think I, I, I don't want to be behind anybody right now okay. because I, there's three guys, there's three people, Hillary Clinton, uh, on the Democratic side. But at least behind Democrats. Yeah, on, uh, the race is between three people, Hillary, yeah. uh, Barack Obama, yeah. and John Edwards. And I haven't, I've haven't. i heard Hillary speak. I like her a lot. I've heard Edwards speak now. I like him a lot. I want to hear what Ed, uh, Obama's going to say. I think Edwards is the most likely one to go all the way. Okay. The problem is in, in American politics, um, the first part of the of the process is to become a nominee for okay. president, and there you're talking just to Democratic voters, and those voters tend to be more left wing, more more liberal, okay. and they tend to pick a more liberal candidate, which in the general election is less likely to win. Okay. Now this time around, I think you could go left wing and still win because so many people here hate Bill. Uh, George Bush, you know, it's not just the Europeans who hate him. I, you know, there's a lot of hatred. Yeah. You saw that because uh, already record crowds are showing up for Barack and Edwards. Uh, Edwards said he got bigger crowds this time than he ever had on the last time he ran as vice president, and that's significant. You can sense. Uh, political movements in the country based on who shows up. Ronald Reagan in 84, for instance, had 40,000 people. Walter Mondale had 400 people showing up in the, in the same city. Okay. So you could sense yeah. that there was a movement of people from one party to the next yeah. because they were tired of what was going on in, in, in one party. And that's happening in American yeah. politics. I, I think that that's going to be the story. Now, there's some wild cards that could happen. If Al Gore runs again, yeah. particularly if, if, let's say Edwards or Barack gets gets nominated, and then Al Gore runs okay. after the nomination, he'll split up the Democratic Party, and uh, by splitting up the voters, he'll let a Republican win again. Okay. So that's a, a wild card that I'm going to be watching for. I'm also interested in um, in Barack and Hillary because of sexism and racism, mm. and it'll be interesting to see. Uh, the choices that people make. Hillary has a lot of negatives against her, by the way. I, everybody I interviewed, including a taxi driver in New Orleans, just have visceral reactions to the Clinton name, you know, either pro or good. Why? 
I don't understand. Well, we don't see it. that from the outside. Yeah, I don't understand it. I think because she was really pushy during the le during the Clinton administration. She tried to push through. She tried to be a visionary like Steve Jobs and push through nationalized health care, which now is a popular uh, topic, right? People are cheering for it. But 10 years ago, they weren't cheering for it. She was pushing it, and she was using that... that uh, she was perceived as using the, um, you know, being a wife of a president as yeah. a as a platform to try to push through a social agenda that a lot of yeah. people just weren't ready for. And the cool thing is she's not like a typical first lady. Um, no. She has things to say. Yeah, and Americans don't like that a lot of times. And there's sex. They should. That's where the sexism comes in, right? Okay. So the sexism is. The women's supposed to be in the kitchen. And yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I live in Germany, yeah. and uh, we have uh, we call her Angie, by the way, yeah. An Angela Merkel, uh, which, uh, well, I don't want to discuss about if it's if it's a woman or not. It's another deal, uh, but <laughs> because it's not, she's not like the the sexiest girl in the world. But uh, this is also a bit of a sexism. Yeah. But as a as a woman, because we used to say girl, as a woman, she has anyways different ways of thinking. Even though I. I'm, I'm pretty much the other way around political um, on the political side. She has done a few things and she can handle the things differently uh, because it's a woman. In France, because uh, I'm, I'm a lot in contact with France, um, it's an April made uh, the, um, over there. And uh, your big friend over there, Loïc Le Maire, is supporting um, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, uh, which I'm not. I'm more the other way around. Um, and, and the other one is a girl also. It's a woman also. And um, there is a newspaper in Germany who put something really nice. They put a paper, a big A3 paper, where they stand um, April 2005, Angela Merkel, uh, April 2007, um, uh, Ségolène Royal, and uh, 2008, uh, Hillary Clinton. Yeah. Don't you think it could be a pretty n a nice world to live in ruled by women? Oh, yeah. And, and today we just saw Nancy Pelosi uh, elected Speaker of the House for the first time, yeah. a woman elected Speaker of the House. I think, I think Hillary would be great. I, I, I've heard her speak, and I think when you hear her speak, um, she changes a lot of the negative connotations that you might have had from the Clinton administration. She's very bright, very able, very uh, good to see both sides of the aisle, and, and uh, I think she would be a good leader. I just don't know that she can get over those negatives. Yeah. I, I, that'll be the question for her campaign. Barack, um, he's an unknown. We don't know him, by the way, in Europe. Yeah. Even yeah. even here, you mean? Yeah. It, well, here he he gives an awesome speech. Okay. So you'll you'll hear him in Europe because he's 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 getting record crowds and is a great speaker. Um, and so, but he's an unknown politically. He's he's not very. Um, uh, he hasn't been through the process. He hasn't really, uh, you know, been tested by the press and, and all that. So he's an unknown. Could be a wild card. You know, that'll the three of them is going to be an interesting, yeah. it's an interesting thing to watch. You, no matter who you like, or if you're a Republican, you hate all three of them all yeah. automatically, yeah. right? It, it's still going to be an interesting thing to watch to see who the American voters pick. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, and there's a common point between all the things we spoke here, uh, Al Gore. Apple. So oh yeah, and and his his um, main thing is global warming. Every time Edward said the word global warming, he got an, a huge ovation. So that's an issue that people care about in America. I hope. And well, that, uh, from what I'm hearing in the audiences, yeah. they care about it. And that's why Al Gore is so dangerous because if he comes in and and says I'm running, he's going to take a lot of voters away from the other three, and change the whole makeup of, of what's ha going to happen. Mm -hmm. I really like the way he starts his uh, speeches. I used to be the president of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> he was for, in for a few minutes. For a few minutes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so now I'm. Uh, I guess you have to run to the CES slowly. It's going to be a pretty f uh, crazy week for you. Oh, uh, it's uh, CES. If you've never been there, have you ever been to CES? No. It's unbelievably big. Uh, um, Unfortunately, I, I got a choice. Yeah. Macworld this time. Well, I went to Macworld and CES last year, and CES is easily. 30 times bigger yeah. than Macworld. It's, so 
you know, it, it takes you 45 minutes to walk from one side of the hall to the next. Yeah. yeah it's just a, it's just huge, you know, yeah. in terms of people and logistics. Getting in at 12 in the morning, there was a two-hour taxi line. That gives you an idea of the people flow that the city sees with this uh, show. It's, it's sort of, have you ever been a C-bit up in Hanover? Yeah, not, but I've been to the Fotokina in Cologne, which, yes. and it's huge. Yeah, it's similar to that size yeah. of a show. Uh, uh, I was at a, a CBIT one year, and CBIT actually is bigger than uh, uh, CES. Okay. But not much. It's about the same scope of... What about Comdex at that time? About well, the same. Big, yeah. yeah, it was also pretty big. But Comdex disappeared, and uh, CBIT probably has gotten smaller mm -hmm. it's also. People are less interested in, in computers because computers haven't changed that much. In the in the 80s and 90s, they were changing a lot, yeah, and a yeah. lot of new stuff was coming out. Consumer electronics is clearly what, where things are happening. You know, cars are going to radically change in the next five years. Okay. You know, you, we're seeing uh, my friend is building a car where you can talk to the car and ask, play Black Eyed Peas, and the car stereo yeah, will play cool. Black Eyed Peas. Yeah, you know, yeah. and you know, show me a map of the city. Show me where I am. You, know, you can talk to the car. Yeah. There's going to be huge innovations yeah. in the next five to ten years because of computerized uh, display devices in the cars. So okay. I got to run. Yeah, so, okay. So thank you anyways. Thank you very much. Yeah. 1984 won't be like 1984. Get your iPod. iPod's here. You like your Macintosh. You like your Macintosh. Your Macintosh. Up, up. And the Macintosh, of all the machines I've ever seen, is the only one that meets that standard. iPod. A thousand songs in your pocket. If today were the last day of my life, would I want to do what I am about to do today?